something is obviously desperately wrong as our world is unraveling like a cheap sweater. We see all around us war and strife and envy and conflict and murder and and lying. And most people look in all the wrong places to try to diagnose the problem. They claim that the problem is on the outside of man, that the problem is the environment, the problem is the government, the problem is the economy, the problem is global warming, the problem is your upbringing, your disadvantages, etc., etc., etc. But you and I know that there is no cure for a spiritual problem to be found in politics or in finance. All of these explanations fall short of where the real problem lies. And the fundamental problem of man and the world and the human race lies not outside of man, but on the inside of man. And in one word, it is sin. So what is sin? Well, sin is any lack of conformity to the holiness of God. Sin is any transgression of the law of God. Sin is falling short of the glory of God. Sin is going astray from the will of God. And this is man's greatest problem. If I just say that sin is falling short of the standard, it seems like sin is an error. Sin is a mistake. Sin is just something that we happen to do that we don't want to do. But when you look at the full teaching of Scripture with regard to sin, that's not the case at all. Sin is rebellion. Sin is a crime. Sin is when man puts his will, his volition, against the person of God and against God's law. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is obvious rebellion, intentional rebellion. And all of us have rebelled against God. Now, when we talk about sin, we need to understand that sin is more than just an act. People are not sinners because they sin. People sin because by nature they are sinners. And that's very important to understand. If you see sin as simply an act or a decision, you will treat sin superficially and you will try to find a superficial cure. But sin is not merely a decision. It goes all the way into the heart of man, a heart that is fallen. A heart that is can be properly called morally depraved. A heart that is spiritually dead. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and, by, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's two important things here. He, he brings this full circle. When he refers to the rest of mankind, he's making a point there. The point there goes back to the world. And it is not as though the world is just sort of here in pockets here and there. It's the rest of mankind. And the people who are not under this influence are in the minority. There is a broad gate and there is a narrow gate. But before he says this, he makes reference to our flesh, to our own desires to our bodies and our minds and what our bodies and our minds want. So here's why the world and the devil are so powerful. Because they give us exactly what we want. That's who we are. We're not individuals who would otherwise pursue God if the devil would just leave us alone. Far from it, since the fall, with the first Adam as our federal head, we are averse to all good things. Listen to the way the confessions put it, both Westminster and London. From this original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposed to all good and wholly inclined to all evil do proceed all actual transgressions. Our sins come from our sin nature. 
It's who we are. It's what we want. It's what we desire. So don't think of it as though we, we come into this world and we're innocent and we're really looking for a way to find God and a way to please God, but all of a sudden this world says, no, don't do that. And the devil says, no, don't do that. Actually, no, that's not radical enough. That's not sinful enough. That's not who you were. Here's who you were before you came to Christ. You came with fleshly desires that were against God. You came with desires of your body and your mind that were alienated to God. You came with desires that were evil. And the devil and the world did not have to seek you out. You rested in them because they gave you exactly what you wanted. The devil knows your name and you know his voice. You were convinced that he loved you as much as you loved him. The world was a comfortable place to you and was all that you wanted. And that is because your very nature craved it. Now, we're going to take a look for just a moment at that heart. And I want us to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 5. This is prior to the flood of Noah. As a matter of fact, it's the reason for the flood of Noah. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, listen to the language. It's very important language. He says that the wickedness of man was great. Now, this is in God's estimation. It was it was gigantic. It was pervasive. It was, it was through and through affecting absolutely everything that man is and that man did. That it was great on the earth. And every intent of the thought of a man's heart was only evil. Every intent was only evil. And then the adverb continually, always, ongoing, again, pervasive evil. Now, Someone may object to that and they may say, well, no, my thoughts aren't like that. Well, let me do something to you that I did to a young reporter many years ago when he said that we were in a very large auditorium. He came up. He was very angry. He said, I don't believe man is as bad as you say he is. And I said, sir, I did not say that man was bad. I read the scriptures and the scriptures said that men were bad because he claimed to be a Christian. He said, men are not that bad. I said, sir, if I could take out your heart right now, and I'm say the same thing to you. If I could take out your heart right now, all the thoughts that you have ever had from the moment you began realizing that you were thinking, even until now, even the thoughts you've had in the last 15 minutes in this room, and I could take those thoughts and I could put them on a DVD. And I could show that DVD here today. You would run out of this room and you would never show your face here again. You know that's true. You would do everything in your power to keep me from showing everyone the thoughts of your heart throughout the full course of your life. Now, I want you to think about this. You would be utterly ashamed even though you know everyone in the room is just like you, you would still be utterly ashamed. Now imagine this, the day of judgment, and you stand before God, a holy God, and all this is revealed in front of him and before a holy heaven. You see, man, his own heart testifies to the truthfulness of Scripture. This is why the doctrine of original sin is so important. If we don't understand the doctrine of original sin, then we don't get this. We don't understand the, we don't understand the sinfulness of our sin because somehow we think that we're innocent and, and, and our environment just somehow made us go all wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. People who don't believe in original sin don't have children. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's not a little angel. That's a viper in a diaper. (laughs) 
You come into this world, you can barely open your eyes. For months, you can barely hold up your head. You have to hold, grab his head now. You can't sit up, you can't talk, you can't crawl, you can't walk. But you can let everybody know <laughs> that you're running things. <laughs> the angry cry happens early. The demanding cry happens early. The stiffening up of the body, that happens early. You're so cute. No, oh, that ain't cute. <laughs> One of the reasons God makes them so small is so that they won't kill you. <laughs> and one of the reasons he makes them so cute is so that you won't kill them. Let's, let's go on. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. It says, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. The flood washed away almost all men from planet Earth. But here we see, after the flood, that not even the flood could wash man's heart. Even from his youth, the word can mean more than just a youth, to go back to to a child or children. And this is something that is very important, very debated, but nonetheless, the scriptures are clear. And on this, I, I look for no compromise. I, I hope to make no truce. The scriptures are clear. Men are born in sin. Men are born radically corrupt. Sometimes I will hear, you know, some type of song about you know, the world would be full of peace if only children led us. Obviously, the person who wrote that song has never had a child. Let me give you an example. Let's take a, a four-year-old child or even a three-year-old child. Let's put him in a room all by himself. And let's give that child every toy imaginable. I mean, just place one toy after another, after another, in front of that child. And then, as we're doing that, we find a toy that the child does not want. And so we put the toy back in the child's hand, and the child throws it away. We put it back in the child's hand, he throws it away. He even becomes angry, he doesn't want the toy, and he throws it away, and we do it again and again, to prove the child does not want the toy. But I can make that child want that toy more than all the other toys that he loves. How? I bring another child of the same age into that room and I give that child that toy that that other child does not want. And what happens? World War III. Now, I want you to look at that. Now, we laugh and I know the story's funny, but I want you to realize something. That is the reason for World War II. That is the reason for 30 million Russians dying in World War II. That is the reason for 6 million Jews dying in World War II. That is the reason for all the murders that will happen today. Notice that you do not have to teach a child to be selfish. You do not have to teach a child to be angry or even violent. You do not have to teach a child to lie. As a matter of fact, you have to spend a great deal of energy to teach them to do the opposite. And that's why the world and its social ideas are so wrong to the point of absurdity. Absurd, absolutely contrary to reality. People say, no, you just you just make society better and the child will be better. Do you realize, and it's hard for us because we no longer study history. If you're living in the United States, Canada or Western Europe, you have the most affluential, easiest life that history has ever known. And yet we are the most violent and incontent people there's no contentment about us. 
constantly wanting more, constantly warring, constantly angry, constantly depressed. My dear friend, people say, well, it's society that deforms the child. Do you not realize of what society is made? Of adults, just like the child. Sooner or later, all this problem has to make its way back to man and the heart of man. And that is the problem. Man must be changed. He must be because he is a sinner. The Bible says that man loves self more than God, that man loves the pleasures of sin more than the righteousness of God. The Bible teaches that all men are born as haters of God. They're sinners. See, we, we don't understand this. That's why we have no urgency about sharing the gospel with the nice old lady down the street. Because after all, she's just a nice old lady. We don't get this. That, that's why we stand up at funerals and, and say that people who never wanted to be with God on this earth are in a better place spending eternity with the one that they didn't want to be with here. <laughs> because we don't get this. We don't understand this. And because we don't understand this, we don't understand how desperate we are for a radical redemption. Actually, because we don't understand this, we don't think we need to be saved. We actually just think we need to be helped. We don't think we need good news. We think we need good advice. We don't need the gospel. We just need 10 ways to have a happy life and five ways to reduce stress because that's our problem. We don't believe this. And this is why we say, we, we hear preachers say it all the time. There's a guy down my way, down in Houston, smiling Joel. <laughs> smiling Joel says, sinners don't need to be told they're sinners. They know they're sin. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They look at the guy on the news who hacks somebody up and they say, that's a sinner, not me. They don't sin. They make mistakes. You sin, but they don't. They make bad choices. They have bad patches. They have bad habits, but they're not sinners. They're not individuals who pursue their own fleshly desires at the expense of everyone and anything else, unless they can be helped in their fleshly desires. They're not sinners who are under the influence of this world because this world is giving them exactly what they want, which is not God. They're not sinners who are under the influence of the prince of the power of the air because they love the prince of the power of the air, they're just people who sometimes make mistakes. But the Bible says that they're children of wrath, and so were we. If you understand that you're a child of wrath, you understand that you don't need good advice, you need good news, because there is no good news in this. This is all bad. There's no hope whatsoever. I'm dead, and I'm under the influence of this world that opposes God and the prince of the power of the air who opposes God. And what's worse, my flesh, my body, my mind, they like it and they want it and they don't want God. And I'm an enemy of God and I deserve God's wrath. By the way, here's a footnote. In case you were wondering, because so many people miss this one. I love to ask people, you know, even if you know you, you need to be saved, you know what you need to be saved from? God. Amen. Amen. You need to be saved from the wrath of God, this holy and righteous and just God. And then he adds, because all sinned. And at the moment that Adam sinned, his offense, his sin was imputed to every person that would ever be conceived in their mother's womb. And so when did you become a sinner? Over 6,000 years ago, Adam's sin was charged to your account, and long before you were conceived and long before you entered into this world, you were already condemned, and you were already under the wrath of God, and you were already a sinner. This imputation of Adam's sin, it was immediate. It took place to the entire human race once and for all at that point. It was comprehensive. It went to every member of the human race. It was realistic in the sense that we were charged as though we ourselves had committed that sin. It was fatal in that it brought death, 
and it was representative in the sense that the one man acted on behalf of the many. And this is reinforced five more times here in Romans chapter 5 in the following verses. And I want to let your eye go down the page from verse 15 to verse 19, and I want you to see verse 15 where it says, by the transgression of the one, the many died. Adam's one transgression brought death to the entire human race. Verse 16, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation, the divine punishment and judgment of God on the entire human race. Verse 17, we read, by the transgression of the one, death reigned. And death reigned like a cruel tyrant and has ruled over the human race from the time of Adam's sin. It's appointed in a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. In verse 18, we read in Romans 5, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. And so, eternal condemnation and eternal punishment was declared by God against every member of the human race long before they were conceived or born. And then in verse 19, we read, through the one man's disobedience, referring to Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners because his sin was imputed to every person, and we were charged as guilty before God before we entered the human race. This is the doctrine of imputation, that the action of one man is regarded as the actions of the many others. And it is based upon the principle of federal headship that the action of a representative head would affect all those whom he represents. And Adam was our representative head, and his actions would be accredited to us and would be imputed to us. And so, his one act has condemned the entire human race to the end of the age, till the last person is conceived in the womb. And this speaks volumes of the holiness of God, that just one sin would condemn the entire human race, just one sin by one man, and the entire future population of the world stood judged and condemned before God. That's how holy God is, and that is how sinful one act of rebellion against this holy God is taken seriously by Almighty God. One sin by one man and the entire human race condemned. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. I love, there's no room there. There's no room there. There's nothing there. There's nothing God saw in you. It's just not there. There's nothing in you that rose up above the rest. It's just not there. The answer is, but God, you're dead. I don't care how many times you've heard the illustration. You're sinking. You're drowning. You're about to go down for the last time, and God throws you the life preserver, but you got to grab it. Dead men don't grab. You are a rotting corpse. You are not almost dead. You are not nearly dead. But you're dead, which means that the only hope is the grace of God.